Have you ever bought a game on Steam and immediately regretted that purchase? This normally leads into Googling Steam refunds and hoping that you didn't play the game long enough to recoup your losses. Well, you aren't alone. We've all had this feeling because frankly, these days, Steam is half reputable storefront for interesting experiences and half hot garbage dumping ground for shovelware and risque dating sims. So today, I'm gonna to be taking a look at some of the worst rated games on Steam. I picked 10 different games out of the bottom 100 and dived in. I figured this would be a fun departure from my normal content, and I also decided that I talk about way too many good games on this channel. I figured it was time I got right down into the muck. Hey dad, it's me, your favorite son, and today I'd like to talk about bad games. Before we really get into the games, I'd like to briefly go over how I selected the entries on this list. First, I did not just select the worst rated 10 games on Steam. This is because the video would then have me reviewing Chinese trading card games and Overwatch 2, which I really don't want to do. And I don't think you want to see me do that either. I decided to go down through the list and choose the most enticing entries. I obviously nixed games from the list that just did not run at all or were online games that are now out of service. I also tried to choose a slightly wider variety of genres so that this didn't result in an hour of me talking about terrible city building sims. There's a surprising amount of those on the bottom 100. Because of this, I chose 10 games that were an entertaining variety, but also had bad enough ratings on Steam that the average player would not recommend them. That being said, there were still some games that ran pretty poorly no matter what I did, so forgive me if some of the footage isn't the greatest. You want forgiveness? Get religion. What? Also, I just want to point out that I will not be delving incredibly deep into every single game. This won't be a complete retrospective on all 10 games, just a general overview of each project, the research I did into them, and some other tangentially related projects. I will say though that I did try to give each game a fair chance and play them for as long as I felt was necessary. With that, let's get into the games. The first game that I played for this video was Flat Out 3 Chaos and Destruction. Flat Out 3 is a racing game first and foremost. At the time of writing this script, Flat Out 3 is actually the fourth worst reviewed game on Steam with mostly negative reviews. Flat Out 3 was developed by Team 6 Game Studios and published by Strategy First. As you can tell, this is the third game in a series of racing games. The previous entries were developed by Bugbear Entertainment. The first two games in the series were actually pretty reputable, both hitting around the 70 mark on their Metacritic scores. Both of the games were praised for their responsive and tight controls, and the realistic destruction of cars and obstacles for the time. But like every good thing, it had to eventually come to an end. In December of 2011, Flat Out 3 was released for Microsoft Windows to an almost resounding no. It wasn't just fans that were giving this game bad reviews, it was critics as well. The gaming publication Edge gave it a 1 out of 10, a score that it has only ever given one other game, Kabuki Warriors, for the Xbox. So what garnered all of this hate? Well, first of all, for a driving game, Flat Out 3 has pretty bad controls. It just feels incredibly wonky to play. Where a good racing game feels like being behind the wheel of a finely tuned machine, Flat Out 3 feels like driving a souped up tractor through a frozen cornfield. Every action you take to turn the controls in the way that you want leaves you flailing. The jumping and the physics feel even worse. It's cartoony, but not in a good way. I could see how this game could want to have unrealistic physics. It's a game based around demolishing other cars and taking out the competition, warping your own machine in the process. But it feels more Bugs Bunny than anything. When you hit a ramp, your car falls down with this weird and unsatisfying thud. But racing isn't the only thing that you can do in Flat Out 3. There are a ton of game modes that we can try out. Some would say far too many game modes. Me, I would say that. In addition to racing, we can also do stunts, a mode which sees us flinging our character through the windshield and aiming for some sort of goal. This mode was in the previous Flat Out game, but this really just feels like a downgrade. In addition to the myriad of hair-raising graphical glitches, it just never feels all that fun. 
The mode itself actually reminds me of the PlayStation Store game Pain, a game where you flung your character into a city and tried to do as much damage as you could. I should also point out that the characters in Flat Out 3 have a pretty distinct parody theme to them. This game definitely seemed like it wanted to be one of those early 2000s shock humor games. A few of the characters are based on real celebrities like Katie Boxing Sale, Jennifer Ellistor, Eufer Bull, and Zario the Mechanic is just straight up Ron Jeremy. The big battle mode in Flat Out 3 allows you to go up against tons of other cars, vying for the top spot of 24 by doing the most damage, basically a massive demolition derby. All of the demolition modes kind of suck because you can really get stuck when one of the AI just repeatedly runs into you, giving you no room to get out. You just have to be okay with getting rammed into a wall until your car eventually explodes. Battle Arena is another mode which is basically the same thing but with less cars. Not sure why they needed two modes for these, but okay. I do know why actually. It's because they wanted to pad out the game so it looked like there was a lot more to do. For some reason, the battle arena mode is terribly slow compared to the big battle mode. I spent 10 minutes just circling cars in this mode, trying to damage other racers. The goal is just to run into other cars as fast as you can, but I have no idea how the game decides to calculate damage. I will get as much speed as I can, slam into a vehicle from its side, and flip it across the map, and the game will pop up, you did 1% damage but then I'll lightly graze a vehicle while trying to get out of the middle of the map, and it'll say, you did 5% damage. In any case, the amount of damage that you do is just too low, and it makes this whole mode take forever. Also, why is there no health meter for my car on screen? Instead of having a static meter, it just constantly updates you on your health with a pop-up that shows every 10 seconds or so to tell you your health percentage. The night shift mode is described by the game as the most difficult race mode in Flat Out, but it's really just rainy and foggy. I guess you could say that the visibility makes it a little harder, but it really doesn't seem that much different from a normal race. The speed mode sees you driving Formula One-like cars that have higher top speeds than the others, but that's really it. And the search and destroy mode allows you to drive monster trucks with the goal of finding barrels hidden around the map. The splat out mode is the game's zombie mode, where you drive around and try to hit the undead in quick succession, racking up points the faster you can manage it. And the off-road mode is basically a free-for-all, where you try to get the highest score in drifting, jumping, destruction, and wrecking. All of these modes really just feel hollow. There's only a couple that I could see any person playing more than once. The novelty of things like splat out and speed mode and search and destroy seem like one-time plays. That being said, I can't really see anyone playing any of these modes more than once due to the janky controls and terrible AI. Because this game was so bad though, and I had no prior exposure to the Flat Out series, I decided to go back to Flat Out 2 to see what all of the fuss was about. And oh man, was this a f game. It's one of those games that just has a ton of soul. It's totally a product of its time. The aesthetic is driving shitty cars on broken down tracks, trying to avoid obstacles and slam into your opponents, all while the fantastic butt rock soundtrack plays through your speakers. It's a fantastic early 2000s racing game. The destruction is really cool and running your opponents off the track feels really satisfying. The controls are much better than the game that came after it. They feel tight, responsive, and just all around good. You can upgrade your car with money you earn from winning cups, but you can also get extra bonuses from hitting the most cars during a race or having the fastest lap. There's a lot of customization here, but honestly the biggest thing this game has over Flat Out 3 is that it's just fun to play. During playing all of these games, I found myself going back to Flat Out 2 just to do a couple races here and there because it was so entertaining. There's definitely a nostalgia for the time there, where these games were one in a million, when you could walk into an EB Games and this would be sitting on a shelf next to MX Unleashed. You could buy either and take them home, eventually putting hundreds of hours into them because they just figured out the formula for fun. Playing Flat Out 2 also gives me an appreciation for how terrible the third game in the series is. Once I went back to it, everything immediately clicked. I could see why fans of the series would be frustrated over this release. 
Flat Out would have two more games in the series before it inevitably went dark. Flat Out Stuntman was an iOS game that seemed to focus on the stunt mode from the previous games, and Flat Out 4 Total Insanity was the last mainline game in the series, switching developers once again, receiving mixed reviews on release, but hey, at least it wasn't mostly negative. Uriel's Chasm was developed by Rail Slave Games, a company that I can't find too much about online. I do know that the game was created by a man named Dylan Barry, who has a great passion for making weird and rebellious projects. Uriel's Chasm has a terrible score on Steam. It is the sixth worst reviewed game on the platform. This game does open with a real video of two girls calling themselves shovelware queens and is interspersed with clips of people criticizing the game itself. Now, I'll be honest, the game itself is pretty bad. Each level has a new style of gameplay, where the first one sees us mining rocks in space to try and get Bible verses, and where the second sees us side-scrolling to destroy space monsters. None of the styles that the game tries to emulate work very well. There's a ton of jank here, and controlling these truly feels like shoving a square shape into a round hole. It just doesn't work. But tons of people have talked about the janky gameplay of Uriel's Chasm. I want to talk about the style. This was the first thing that gripped me when I booted the game up. The game's aesthetic is incredibly interesting. It's almost eerie with its dialogue and writing. The art can either be incredibly simple, amateur style work, or some of the strangest, most underground stuff you've seen. This is exactly what Barry wanted to do. In an interview with Killscreen, he described indie games as something darkly rebellious and destructively psychedelic. He wanted to make something different, something people hadn't seen before, something that would bring shock and awe. But I think Uriel's Chasm is really a game that mostly just brings promise in aesthetic and poor game design. The levels feel weak, with foregrounds blending into background, there's way too much UI on the screen, things don't work like they should, it's a total mess. But because of the promise of the aesthetic, I wanted to see what the other games in the series were like, so I booted up Uriel's Chasm 2. And boy, is it all the first game had and more. The aesthetic is still there, incredibly inventive colors and writing, the gameplay has gotten a little better, a little tighter in control, but it can still be really janky. During the beginning section, I have almost no idea what's going on on the right side of the screen, outside of the boss's health meter. It's just an insane schizo simulator. The second section sees us protecting the Garden of Paradise from the fires that are trying to burn it down. This game was still pretty similar to the first, but the writing was still very interesting, so I decided to check out the third and final game of the series. Uriel's Chasm 3 is one of the most inventive and interesting projects that I have ever seen, and I have no idea what is happening in it. The story seems to open in some new facility that is dedicated to reanimating ancient genetic material. In the game, we play a blob that moves around the facility and talks to other blobs or destroys other blobs. I don't know what any of this is, but the interface that almost feels like we're playing an alien Game Boy, the art, the colors, the foreign interface, and the music all create an atmosphere that you just don't want to leave. One that's both terrifying and inviting at the same time. I can't say I've played all of Rail Slave's games, as they have four others on Steam, and it seems like their most recent one was Nauseous Pines, which came out in November of 2019. I can't say that any of these games are actually good, technically speaking anyways, but did they scratch an itch? For sure. These are the types of games that you can only find in the indie scene, ones that are genuinely trying new things, a fresh take and perspective on the medium. Incredible amounts of style, uniqueness, truly one-of-a-kind games, like no other. In that same interview with Killscreen, Barry describes it perfectly. Polish or popular conventions don't usually come into it. Originality was always my reason for everything. I will 100% go down with this ship. Space Base DF9 is a game that is not particularly original. Space Base was developed by Double Fine, who are most known for making Psychonauts, Brutal Legend, Costume Quest, and Broken Age. Double Fine hosted a public prototyping session called Amnesia Fortnite in 2012, which would allow users to vote on the five prototype games that they would like to see become full projects. Of these games, the second highest voted was Space Base DF9. 
This game is primarily a base building management simulator. We are given a space station and it's our job to manage the different people living on it. Cordon off rooms for the people to live in, do jobs in, and relax in. We can create new spaces, bars, restaurants, resource refineries. This is all in the goal of expanding our base. Ideally, we send out crew to gather resources and new people and develop new parts of our station, gaining access to new features of the base, and it sort of works in a way. At its best, Space Base DF9 is really just your regular, average simulation game. Not a ton of complexity and just all around pretty bland. At its worst, Space Base DF9 is a broken and unbalanced mess. One of the worst problems with the game is that our crew can die. Now, this is a pretty common thing in these types of games and presents a challenge for us to overcome, but the problem here lies when we get attacked. Pirates will eventually try to board our ship and take us out. Out. This happens incredibly often and usually does not give us enough time to recover. Each game mostly ends the same then, our crew getting wiped out by pirates. There are ways to circumvent this though. Each crew member that we obtain gets a role. Miners can be sent out to retrieve resources, builders can then use those resources to expand on the base, technicians can maintain the constructions that builders have placed, we even have bartenders, botanists, and scientists. Each crew member is good at a certain number of jobs and bad at others, but they also like certain jobs more than others. Putting a crew member in a job they like will keep them happy, and if you put them in one they don't like, they'll end up depressed and sad. But one of the most important jobs is security. Security does two things. They respond to immediate threats to the base and can be sent out to search derelict spaceships. They're not really quick or good at either, no matter how high their rating in the field is. They just generally don't respond fast enough and pirates end up killing at least two or three crew members before security dispatches with them. If they invade a derelict ship, most of the time there are too many foes for them to handle at once and this results in a lot of crew deaths. And if it's only one or two members, then this isn't that big of an issue. In the later game, when you have 30 plus crew, it's just not a problem. But in the beginning, it can kill your playthrough. If you do manage to make it into the later stages of the game, you will realize its true downfall, the stupidity of the AI. Most crew, half the time, just don't seem to do what they are designed to do. You can't really tell if the game is just bugging out, or if the crew are just unresponsive. Sometimes it's both, and you're never really sure. At one point, I extended a room to fit more structures and tore down the old wall to make it bigger, but instead of building the room first, my builders just tore down the wall and it killed everyone on the base. Technicians will just avoid fixing certain machines, security will avoid enemies, researchers won't research, doctors won't doctor, it just ends up being a minefield of jank. The game really just doesn't work like it should. The whole crime of this game really is that it's just mediocre. There are games out there that do what Space Base was trying to do way better, and they don't have bugs plaguing the experience. At the end of the day, Double Fine did abandon this project and didn't fix the issues or fully deliver on the promises that they made for the game. There are some fans that have gone back to patch the game and try and make it what it was supposed to be, but at the end of the day, this is an unfinished product being sold to the masses. Goddess is a very interesting project. It was created by Peter Molyneux and developed by his newly created studio, 22 Cans. You probably know Molyneux from games like Fable and Black and White. Molyneux is notorious for overpromising and underdelivering. It's just what he does, and he does it well. In 2012, he left Lionhead Studios, the studio behind the Fable series, and created his own studio, 22 Cans. This was meant to be a place where Molyneux could stretch his legs and have full creative control on the projects that he undertook. The first game the studio released was called Curiosity, What's Inside the Cube, a mobile game social experiment. But the first real project that they undertook was Goddess. Goddess is first and foremost a god game, a part of the genre that Molyneux himself helped create and shape. The god game genre is really about creating and shaping a world or influencing a population. Goddess takes this to a new level by having you really play a god that commands and controls a massive population of worshippers. When we first begin, we have very few followers, and they will automatically begin building small settlements and procreating. Our job is to shape the land around them to give them a good space to spread out. 
I will say that I actually do enjoy the land shaping system in this game. We can select each layer and destroy it or pull it out at will. The lower layers can be shaped for free, but to shape the higher layers, we have to use belief. Belief is a currency that is obtained slowly from followers, but also by destroying rocks around our land. Belief is used for everything, to shape the land, to use our god powers, to consolidate houses into villages, it's all over the place. We need a lot of it to do the things we want. As we get more followers, we begin to unlock more powers and features for the game. We can eventually create settlements focused on farming. Farming will make our builders work faster, and we can even then create builder settlements, which create even more efficient builders. A lot of these upgrade cards, though, require stickers to unlock. The stickers are retrieved from finding chests around the world, but also from expeditions. At the time of playing the game, there is only one expedition, but this wasn't really too big of an issue for a while because I never really ran out of stickers. What I did find I needed quite often were gems. Gems allow you to buy belief so you don't have to wait for it to be produced, and also buy stickers or wheat. Now, why does this all sound odd for a PC game? It's because it is. Goddess wasn't like this in the beginning. It looked a lot different, had many different features that were removed, and was then turned into this pseudo mobile game style. The game was also released on mobile where you can actually purchase gems in the store to make things go faster. But because this isn't in the PC release, because it would have been deemed predatory for a Kickstarter game, the game hits a wall and slows down so much. Oh, did I not mention this was a Kickstarter game? 22 Cans wanted 450,000 pounds to create Goddess and ended up funding 526,000. The stretch goals were James Leach writing the game's story, single player and multiplayer modes, and multiplayer co-op, as well as a Linux version of the game. Damn, if they had only gotten 25,000 more, we could have gotten the much-awaited Ouya version of the game. And it doesn't really seem like any of the other promises were fulfilled either. Imagine getting over 500,000 pounds to create a game and then working in a predatory monetization model into the mobile version, but creating the same game for PC without that monetization so the game just doesn't work. Not to mention the fact that the game was just straight up abandoned. Like I said, you reach a certain point where you need to build fountains to keep your villagers' happiness up. Otherwise, the Astari, a rival village, will begin poaching your people. But you can't build a fountain because you need gems. You can get some gems from chests, but they don't always appear. So you have to just wait for new ones to spawn or expand in the hopes that you get some chests before your followers leave. The other incredibly embarrassing part of this unfinished game is that it was left in a beta. So there's just developer commentary from Molyneux every single time you unlock a new feature. He just rambles for minutes talking about how cool this feature is and why you have to make sure you use it right. A lot of it is just Peter trying to explain to us that the game doesn't suck. You're just playing it wrong, and he's lying. If you need to include voice clips recorded in your office with people coughing in the background to convince people that your game is good, then it isn't good. The reason the game is completely unfinished is that in 2015, 22 Cans just decided that the game wasn't worth it and switched focus to another game called The Trail. Fans were incredibly upset because the Kickstarter promises were not delivered whatsoever, and the game was completely abandoned. On top of that, Molyneux had revealed that one person in Goddess would be chosen to rule over all the other players, and that they would receive a portion of the revenue made from the game. The winner, Brian Henderson, never received his money, and in 2017, Molyneux claimed it was because Goddess did not make a profit, so he just wasn't getting anything. And if they would have left it at that, it would have been bad, but not completely awful. But of course, they didn't. In 2016, 22 Cans released a new game in the series, Goddess Wars. This was a real-time strategy version of Goddess. You start on one side of the map and build up your forces by collecting belief from your followers. You shape the land to make it easier for your followers to build and attack the enemy camps. You make soldier units and lay waste to the enemy base, rinse, repeat, over and over and over and over. This game is so incredibly repetitive, not to mention it somehow looks even worse than Goddess. I think the idea of being able to shape land in an RTS is a good idea, but the whole mobile style here is just awful. This game was also similarly abandoned, for good reason, it's terrible. 
In 2021, Molyneux did give an interview where he had stated that they were going to be releasing a new set of features for Goddess before Christmas. It's been two years and no new features have been released. Both games are still in early access. Sacred 3 sucks. I'm sorry, but there's really no other way to put it. Sacred 3 was developed by Keen Games, who was mostly known for making mobile games and licensed projects, as well as Portal Knights. The first two games in the series were, of course, created by a different developer, Ascaron. With the development of the second game in the series, Ascaron actually had to sell off the rights to a lot of their games. The development time took so long that they couldn't pay their debts. Deep Silver bought the rights to the series and decided to create a third game in the series, with Keen at the helm. The game centers around a fantasy tale, to save the gems or the wizards or something. The game cares less about its own story than I do. It cares so little that it has a six minute scene at the beginning of the game to exposition dump all over our faces. It's a bunch of generic fantasy gibberish. But that doesn't even really matter, because even if the game had the best story in the world, the dialogue is some of the worst and most annoying that I've ever experienced. The game tries its damnedest to be quirky and witty, and it just never is. Borderlands and its consequences have been a disaster for the gaming industry. Every single line of dialogue that's uttered is trying to be as funny as it can, but it tries so hard that it comes off as lame. It's just embarrassing, and when I see a game like this, I immediately want to turn it off. On top of that, the combat is incredibly bland. Sacred 3 came during a time when these co-op ARPGs were a dime a dozen. They were everywhere, and you almost couldn't tell the difference between one and another. We run around killing fodder for most of the level and eventually have to kill some mini-bosses before facing a final boss that has the most telegraphed attacks that you've ever seen. It doesn't help, though, that the game controls like ass. It feels like riding a jet ski on an ice lake. I'm running out of video game control metaphors. There's not a lot of customization, skill trees are pretty linear, and there just isn't a lot to do. This seems like one of those games you'd play at your friend's house, and you'd probably beat it four times in a week just because there was nothing else to play. It's definitely nothing you would pick first off the shelf, though. The real crime of this game's existence, though, is the fact that this is called Sacred 3. I wasn't really that familiar with the series before this video. I decided to go back and play Sacred 2 just to see where the series had come from. And oh boy, there could not be a bigger difference. Now, I didn't complete Sacred 2 as that would have required a lot more hours than I was willing to just to dunk on Sacred 3. Maybe it even warrants its own video in the future. But there is a lot here. Even just comparing character selection screens is a wild culture shock. We realize that this game used to have actual customization, an open world, quests, stores, equipment, inventory. Sacred 2 has soul, that undefinable quality, and it honestly is kind of sad to go back once we realize the ending to this story. As you play the game, you realize that it isn't perfect, there are flaws, especially graphical glitches and bugs, but the game was made with passion. The people working on it cared about this series, but ultimately, the series failed. They were forced to sell off their creation, only to see it butchered and warped, rendered into something almost unrecognizable. Sacred 3 sucks. I'm not going to talk at length about Towns because there really isn't a ton to say. I think Towns is mostly on here because of its place in the history of Steam. In 2012, Steam announced a new service called Steam Greenlight. This was a way to streamline indie games getting onto the Steam storefront. Back then, it wasn't that easy to get your game onto storefronts like this. This new system would allow users to vote on new games that were placed in the program, and the community would determine whether they should be admitted to the storefront or not. This was quickly hijacked by fake submissions and joke games that were entered into the program. Valve eventually required developers to put $100 up to put their game into the program, causing a lot of this to go away. The service was also criticized because very few games actually got accepted onto the storefront. It was bottlenecked by Valve themselves having to review games for acceptance. The service was eventually phased out, and now it's much easier for developers to get their games onto the platform. As you can now see, the storefront is littered with junk constantly. But nonetheless, during the first few months of the program, 10 games were accepted onto Steam. These were games like Black Mesa, Kenshi, McPixel, Project Zomboid, and Towns. 
Now, most of the early reception to Towns was poor. This was because most people didn't realize that the game wasn't finished yet. The game was still in its early stages of development. Most of the more recent reception to Towns is also poor because the game was abandoned very quickly. It kind of seems like the devs took the early access money and ran. But what is the game itself? Well, Towns is a city builder. You control a town of people who you can order to build things or harvest the land around you. Now, the real way that the game shines is its systems. It's incredibly in-depth. There is a very long tutorial at the beginning that teaches you mostly how to play the game. Even with that, there's so much that can be done past that. You can edit and build on each layer in the world, meaning you can create houses or structures block for block. You'll need things like ladders or scaffolding for your builders to get up there though. There are tons of things for you to build, so much customization, it really is just a big sandbox. That being said, the game is not finished at all, it isn't beginner friendly, and takes a while to actually figure out. The interface for most of the systems can seem odd and unforgiving. I do think this game showed great promise, and it probably could have been something great if the developers had kept up with it, but now it really just sits as a relic of a lost time. <gasps> Gasp is a nothing game, truly, and I won't waste too much time on it. It was developed and published by Dark Day Interactive. Dark Day was an indie developer that made one game before this, One Final Breath, which was released to similar reception. From what I can tell from the reviews, it's a horror game that mostly consists of finding keys and isn't very scary. I usually do my due diligence with videos and would have played this game just to see what else the dev had to offer, but Gasp was so unfinished and junk that I refuse to give these people money. Gasp begins as you choose one of two planets, Mars, which can only be played with the DLC, or the moon. You know, the planet, the moon. When we start, we find ourselves on the surface of the moon, and a transmission tells us that we have to locate the other five radio sources to find our lost companions. The first thing I did was head out to the closest signal, and pretty quickly, you realize how long this is going to take. In Gasp, you move so incredibly slow. With the low gravity, you slumber along the surface of the planet. The challenge here, I guess, is that your oxygen levels are slowly decreasing, but they never really go down unless you get hit by one of the falling asteroids. So really, we're just walking in a straight line to the nearest waypoint. There is literally nothing else to do. It took me almost 10 minutes of just holding W to get to the first waypoint, only to find out that there's nothing there. You find a small radio laying on the ground that you can't interact with. There's no story beat, no waypoint update, no transmission, it's just there. I'm assuming this was supposed to let you know that the asteroid that had the radio died or went missing. Okay, well let's spend some more excruciating minutes heading towards the next one. Once another 10 minutes has passed and you're about halfway there, you hit an invisible wall. No joke, this isn't a bug. Well, it probably is, but this happens every single time. You just can't get to the other two waypoints off in the distance. I decided to try one more time and head to the other waypoint that I could still see. I spent another 10 minutes walking only to get just before the waypoint and hit another wall. I shut the game off immediately and did some research. Turns out this was a bug and was just never fixed. The real ending of the game is in the Mars DLC. Frustrated and annoyed, I decided to see this through and booted up the quote-unquote expansion. The expansion is the exact same thing except you can actually get to one of the waypoints. You spend over 10 minutes walking in the same direction to find two astronauts floating by a shuttle. You're then told that this was all a simulation and you're actually on a space station of your own and that the ending of the story will be told in another game called Secluded, releasing in 2016. Of course, this never did release. Unfortunately, we'll never get the ending to this incredibly gripping tale that I wasted an hour of my life on. Gasp is literal shovelware. It's just an unfinished piece of junk with no content to be seen. The game itself is free, but it's wild that the DLC is still available for purchase on the storefront. Autobahn Police Simulator is one of those games that you could have fun with if you played it in the right way. Like, the game seems fun if you could play with other people. The game was developed by Z Software, a company that hasn't really seen popularity outside of these games, or 
infamy, rather. All of the games in the series have, at best, mixed reviews, and the first game, the one we're talking about here, has mostly negative. The game itself is a simulator, obviously. It's one of those games in that category where it's trying to be as realistic as possible. You basically have access to a police car and can go on patrols. Most of the game is spent scanning cars to try and find suspicious behavior, and then flagging down criminals and interviewing them. Since we're driving a lot in the game, you'd think that the driving would be somewhat well made, right? Wrong. If we move too fast and make the slightest adjustment, we're sent careening into the guardrails, bouncing back and forth. Good luck trying to get control back, because you're just going to bounce around until the car stops. Interviewing subjects is also pretty odd, because the English dialogue is very poorly translated. Like, have you taken any drugs? What? Me? No way. Drugs are for losers. This lady has definitely taken drugs. Booker. The English isn't exactly broken, like a certain game that will come later in this list, but it's just stunted and awkward. It's all very formal and unrealistic. During each interview, we can choose to search the car, see the suspect's documents, and eventually come to a conclusion on whether to let them go, arrest them, or fine them. This will give us more experience. Having your car's radio on the right channels based on your activity also gives you experience. You have to make sure you're on the open channel when scanning cars and the interviewing channel when questioning suspects. You also just end up getting lost quite often and figuring out how to interface with the fast travel system makes no sense. To fast travel, you have to ride down a road that has fast travel and then it just shows you a map so that you can travel to one of the many different points. But you can't see your destination or any landmarks on the map so you have to just guess. The problem with the game is it's a little janky, the controls are bad, and it just isn't realistic enough. It's not so high in realism that it's a good simulator but it's not unrealistic enough to be fun. It lies somewhere in the middle, neither entertaining or mechanically stimulating. It's just there. It's incredibly boring, there isn't a lot to do. It's just fluff. I can't say that I went to see what the other games in the series were like, to see if they had improved or not. I'm afraid I've already given this game too much of my time. Wars and Roses is a dating sim slash shooter. Technically, it's a s game, like one of the western ones that litter the front of the trending Steam page every day. It was developed by Blaze Worlds, who, big surprise, has abandoned the game since it was released. Now, it is a s game, but none of the n stuff is in the game unless you buy and install the DLC. No, God! No, God, please, no! No! Now, I didn't buy this DLC because one, YouTube would flag me so fast my head would spin, and two, because I don't play Coomer games. The only reason I reviewed the game was because just about everything the game has to offer is terrible in every single way possible. So the game begins with a striking woman approaching our door in the middle of the night. She spouts some nonsense about an all-female mercenary company that she wants us to join, with dialogue that seems like it was either run through Google Translate or written by ChatGPT. When she asks us to join the company, she says, you join or not? And then after we choose an option, says, in fact, there is no option for you to reject me today, because I have already bought the air ticket for you. Ha <laughs> ha. Pack up quickly, the plane took off in two hours. Just broken English all around, terrible dialogue so that already strikes away the dating sim part, meaning 50% of the game is going to be absolutely terrible. Let's at least hope the shooter part of the game is good. The basic setup is that all of the women from the mercenary company have been kidnapped, and it's our job to save them. We save these girls by completing a certain set of missions. Each mission usually sees us invading an area and defeating all of the enemies inside. This game is incredibly easy, mostly due to the fact that the AI is super dumb. Half the time they will get stuck in corners or just stand right in front of our bullets. As soon as we get halfway's decent weapons, we'll just blow through everything in our way. The game is also terribly buggy. There were so many moments on missions where my gun would just start drifting and I could no longer fire it properly. I could see the ends of my arms or my gun would eventually drift and just disappear at the bottom of the screen. The game is so incredibly janky, it just runs so bad. The level design is awful, each one is just the same thing over and over again. Half of the levels will have us walking forever just to reach a big group of enemies and then walk even further to kill the rest. It's just so tedious and it's the same thing over and over again. We can get new weapons by purchasing them in the store, we get money for each mission 
mission completed and can use that to upgrade our armor, helmets, buy grenades, health kits, but none of it's really necessary. I spent most of the game saving up to buy a sniper because a lot of the later levels are really open, so I wanted a way to quickly defeat enemies from afar, but the guns are just so inaccurate and the sniper doesn't even do that much damage, so it ends up just being a waste of time. But how does the dating sim aspect of the game come into play? Well, completing certain levels will see us rescuing damsels that need saving. Once we do this, we can actually equip them into our squad, and they will run around in circles doing seemingly nothing for most of the levels, but it's cool to have them there, right? Going on missions will then increase their relationship meter. This can also be increased by buying them gifts in the store. Each time we increase the relationship meter, new events will unlock. This reveals more of their story, usually something about how they're actually a tragic figure and will learn to love us. It's incredibly boring and of course terribly written as I already stated. I actually beat all of the levels in the game only afterwards realizing that there was a glitch in the game that lets you auto-complete levels. You can also get infinite ammo by just quickly switching between your primary and secondary weapon, just in case any of you have been so intrigued by my description that you've already decided to go out and purchase Wars and Roses. The reason for the negative reviews mostly is not actually because of the terrible gameplay. It's actually because the game isn't finished and there aren't enough Coomer scenes in the DLC. What? What the f But, alright Coomers, go ahead. Overall, just a terrible experience. Would not recommend going anywhere near this. The final game that I'll be talking about today is Their Land. Their Land actually has a pretty interesting story and reason that it got its spot on the worst reviewed games on Steam. Before we get further, I would like to say, unless you have played any of these games, don't go automatically review any of them. If you do play them and genuinely think they are bad, then go ahead. But please do not review bomb any of these games unless you yourself have actually played them and determined that they are not worth it. Do not take my word for it because that's not what this is for. I say this because their land got popular from TikTok. A bunch of dumbasses on that trash app somehow decided that this game was a multiplayer survival game, and it's not. It's a single player action adventure game. The short clips of the game stating that it was a multiplayer survival game went viral and people started to flock to the game, only then realizing that it was nothing like they had been told. They started review bombing the game because it wasn't what they expected. This was so bad that it led the developer to place a note at the beginning of the game telling people that it is single player and asking them to please not leave negative reviews for the game. Now, I was really excited to play their land because I was ready for this to be a redemption story, a game that was wrongly scorned and then turned out to be actually pretty good, or at least somewhat mediocre. I'm sad to say that isn't really the case. Their land is rough around the edges in just about every way. The story begins with Jeremy being interviewed by maybe a news program or the police, we aren't really sure. He's telling the story of how he was stranded on an island and captured by an uncontacted tribe. Jeremy was part of a crew that was investigating a new island that was completely undiscovered. The island could have untold treasures or even just be fertile ground to colonize. Once the group arrives there, they realize it's anything but undiscovered and there is already a tribe living there. We are separated from our group, most of the people we came with are killed, and we're eventually helped by a girl that is native to the island. She helps us get back to our people and they shoot her on sight as they think she's dangerous. Jeremy then goes on a rampage, killing everyone in sight. He then tells the interview team that everyone was killed by a monster and he was the only survivor and they don't seem to believe him. The whole theme of the story is just that this is their land and not ours. We're supposed to realize that we are actually the bad guys here and not them. It's done in such a forced way though and the presentation doesn't help it one bit. The game itself arms us with a gun, the same gun we'll use throughout the project's pretty short runtime. This game has the single worst shooting mechanic I have ever seen in a video game. To bring up our gun, we have to hold down the space button. If we want to aim down sights, then we have to hold down the space button and the right mouse button. Oh, also the space button is our dash to get away from enemies, so good luck with that. It's just so pointless because this is a PC game. There's so many other buttons you could have picked. Or, you know, you could have just have the gun up all the time, considering there are no other weapons we can use in the game. Or even have a button to toggle the gun out or holstered. There's so many ways you could do this, but this developer picked the single worst one. 
The character models and dialogue are also very poor, which make the game's story actually worse than it is. You can tell that much time wasn't spent on line reads because it's all pretty dry and bad. It feels very goofy in most parts. Throughout our time in their land, we will kill many beasts, wolves, centipedes, big unknown monsters, but we'll also solve puzzles. The puzzles in this game are so simple. It's the same thing over and over. We find sticks and take them to a gate to replace the lever and open the gate. We find planks and take them to a gap to get to a new place. We find torches to burn brush. That's basically it, and those three are all virtually the same thing. There is one other type of puzzle in the game, but it's literally just that one puzzle from the beginning of Skyrim. I say this with some reservation, but their land is not a good game. It's pretty rough in most places, but this was made by a solo dev over a couple of years, and I will give him credit for that. I think this does show promise though, and it's incredibly disheartening that this game got the reception that it did. Does it deserve a mostly negative rating on Steam? Probably, but having mostly reviews that complain because it isn't the game they thought it is, isn't as good as genuine feedback. The developer could have taken genuine feedback and used it to learn, making himself better in the process and fixing his mistakes next time. And I do think there is some promise here. The amount of effort and dedication that it takes to create something like this is a lot. If he tightens up the mechanics, introduces some variety, and thinks of some fresher ideas for a story, then we would really have something that's not bad. It's a long way to go, but I see something interesting there. Hey Dad, thanks a lot for watching this video. Also, thanks as always for liking, commenting, and subscribing to the channel. The support really means a lot. I wanted to try out something new in between series, just as a little bit of a breather for the channel. The next series really is going to be a big one, so it's going to take some time to write and research. It's also always fun to try out something new and stretch different mental muscles. If you like the style of this video, let me know in the comments. If you want to see another video like this, recommend some games in the comments for me to review next. Bye, Dad.